Patricia Leanne Caldwell was born in the small town of Smyrna, Tennessee. She is the daughter of Robert and Irma Caldwell. At the age of three, her family moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and later returned to Tennessee when Patricia was 12 years old. This move rekindled her friendship with Frederick McKissick. Patricia grew up with segregation and, in, and in, uh, injustices, which she writes about. She spent many countless hours in the Nashville Public Library, which was one of the few places that wasn't sanctioned by segregation. However, it was her family life that was bountiful and flowing with tales told by her storytelling grandfather. She was raised with the love of reading and the love of the oral tradition. Patricia graduated from Tennessee State with a Bachelor of Arts in degree in English in 1964. She also married her childhood friend, Frederick McKissick, that same year on December 12th. Patricia and Frederick are the parents of Frederick Lemel and twins Robert and John. Her education continued with a master's degree in early childhood literature and media programming in 1975 from Webster University. Patricia had a successful career as a teacher and a children's book editor. She stepped out on faith and changed careers to become a full-time writer of children and young adult books. Her first goal as a writer is to create books for and about African Americans. Patricia stated at the Virginia Hamilton Conference at Kent University, and I quote, I write because there's a need to have books for, by, and about the African American experience and how we help to develop this country. I present to you Patricia McKissick, Storytelling, the Heart of Literacy. My name is Patricia McKissick, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Now, a lot of you think I have said it incorrectly when I say Missouri. You think I got to slid into it in my southern dialect, right? No. I was not born in St. Louis. I was born in Nashville, Tennessee, a little town outside of Nashville, Smyrna, Tennessee. That's where I grew up. That's where I graduated from high school, met, married my husband. We moved back to St. Louis where I had lived part of my life. And I heard people saying, Missouri and Missouri. And I wondered, okay, what's the correct pronunciation of our new state, our new home? Well, you know, if you ask people, you'll get all kinds of, of answers. The best place to go when you want information is where? <laughs> of course, we all know that. And so I went to the library and found a, a book. The librarian gave me a wonderful book and began a, a lifelong friendship with the librarian. And I read that Missouri is the Native American pronunciation. The Native Americans who lived in our area were called the Missouras. And in their language, it means people of the big boats. That one word means all of that. Missouri. Pierre Leclerc were two Frenchmen Pierre Leclerc and Auguste Chateau were two Frenchmen who came up the Mississippi River. And they found the confluence and said that'd be a great place to have a trading post. And so they set up a trading post and called it St. Louis. Being Frenchmen, they pronounced words that they heard the French way, so Missouri became Missouri. Now I ask you, which one is correct, Missouri or Missouri? Okay. <laughs> Neither one. <laughs> you can't say the Native Americans were wrong for saying Missouri. You can't say the French were wrong for pronouncing it in their language. It's just different ways of pronouncing the same word. And that's where we have the problem is with the word different. Different is not a synonym for wrong. Unfortunately, it has become so. We have to be very careful about that word and how we use it and how our children use it. And it also answers the question, why do you write, Pat? <clears throat> I write to tell that different story, the one that's fallen through the cracks, the one marginalized by mainline, mainstream history the stories that have been 
either misrepresented or represented in a way in which it is stereotypical. I write to take those stereotypes, reshape them, and give them back to you dressed in a new dress. I mean, when I say different, it's not a synonym for wrong. It means that we should celebrate those things. You know, we used to avoid, oh, no, there is no difference. Yes, there are wonderful differences. We're all different. Everyone in this room is different in some way. But you should not feel bad about that. Feel good about that. Your uniqueness, your, as my grandson who loves to make up words, that's your wonderment. <laughs> <coughs> so it answers that question <coughs> that I get asked most often is, why do you write? And so you can say Pat McKissick writes to tell that different story. And different is not a synonym for wrong. Before I was a writer, however, I was a listener. I grew up listening to stories, listening to language. Come with me to Nashville, Tennessee, to an old farmhouse. It's set back off the road, little squat house, had a window here, a window here, and the doorway. It looked like a face, two windows, door, and the front porch kind of sagged, so it looked like a smiley face. <laughs> and there was a long um, sidewalk that led up to the house, and when you turned and started toward it, you always felt like you were going to a warm and happy place. My grandparents loved to, in the evening, sit on the front porch. There was always a radio that sat in the window. My grandfather would listen to the ball games. And I always remember when Marian Anderson would sing or Mahalia Jackson would sing, my grandmother would make us be quiet because you had to listen to greatness. You were quiet and respectful before greatness. Then every once in a while, a neighbor would come by and my grandmother would go and excuse herself and come out with a pitcher of lemonade or iced tea. And she'd have those little tea cakes that I loved. Now, most of the time, we children were told, go on and play, because you didn't sit and listen to grown folks' conversation, as she would say. And so we had to go play when the neighbors gathered, unless they started telling stories. And at that point, we were all welcome. And the stories were layered. The seniors got something out of the stories that the young parents and the mothers and the fathers learned, and then the teenagers, and then finally, the little ones. We all got something out of the stories. They were layered. I try to do that in my writing. I try to layer so that the reader who's sharing the story with the young person will get something out of it or see something in it that they can learn from as well. My mother loved to do Dunbar poetry. I would sit in the hollow of her arm on the porch swing, and she would begin reciting Dunbar. Little brown baby with sparkling eyes. Come to your pep and sit on his knee. What you been doing, sir? Making sand pies? What? Look at that bib. You's as dirty as me, and look at that mouth. That's molasses, I bet. <laughs> Come in, Maria, and wipe off his hands, because B's going to catch him, and him being so sweet and sticky, goodness lands. Oh, when Mama would do that, I would say, oh, Mama, do it again, please, please. And then when she'd finish, I'd beg her to do it again, and she would say, no, go to bed now. <laughs> but I grew up listening to Dunbar, who wrote in dialect, Little Brown Baby, but he could also write in standard English, wrote beautiful things in standard English. An angel robed in spotless white bent to kiss the sleeping night. Night woke to blush, but the spirit was gone. Men saw the blush and called it dawn. Oh, I fell in love with that 
beautiful black angel. I could just visualize it when my mother would recite it. Oh, I know why the caged bird sings and beats his hot bars and would be free. It is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that upward to heaven he flings. Oh, I know why the caged bird sings. My Angelou thought enough of his poem to name the first line in it the name of her autobiography. I know why the caged bird sings. It comes from Dunbar's poem, Sympathy. I like Dunbar because he spoke like my grandfather in some of his poems. My grandfather used words the way Dunbar described them. Good morning, Mr. James. How, how you feeling this morning, a neighbor might say. And he would say, oh, I'm stepping, but not high. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that wonderful? OK. Stepping, but not high. I would say, Dad James, may I go play down by the creek? And he would say, well, yes, darling, but be particular. <laughs> that meant be careful. That meant be careful, and because I love you, and I don't want anything to happen to you. He didn't have to say all of that. It was coded in the B particular. And I understand he could say, and he knew and did often say, be careful now. That meant one thing. But B particular meant there was some stuff down by the creek that I needed to be careful of, and he wanted me to be careful and watch what I was doing because he didn't want anything to happen to me. He didn't have to say all of that. B particular did it all. And when he would say, now, when you go over there, I want you to walk and hold your head up like you belong to somebody. OK? That meant you are representing your family. And we want you to carry yourself in a way that you represent your family well. He didn't have to go through all that. Just hold your head up and walk like you belong to somebody. Because if you didn't, that meant you were just kind of growing up like a weed. I love Dunbar for that reason. Fast forward, fast forward many years later. I'm a teacher, I'm teaching eighth grade English and I want to give my students Dunbar. But when I go to the library, there's not a single book about him in the library, not a children's book. There's a few adult books and biographies, but nothing for young readers. So I complained. You know, it's a shame they don't have a book about Dunbar. How come they don't have a book about Dunbar in the library? Somebody ought to write a book about Dunbar. <laughs> and then it hit me one day, instead of whining and complaining about why I haven't got something that I need, write it yourself. But I had never written a book before. How do you start? Well, I went to the library again found the book, How to Write a Children's Book. Not a very imaginative title, but it told me what I needed. I read the book from cover to cover, researched it. Oh, I knew every little detail about Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Even went to his home in Dayton, Ohio, and visited his house where he wrote. Came back, wrote it, took it to class, shared it with my students. And they said, Miss McKissick, who wrote this? It's awful. <laughs> it's so boring. And I said, I from <clears throat> mercifully, I had not put my name on it. It was dreadful. And the reason why? Because I had simply paid attention to details. I had not told a good story. I had not bothered to give the young reader a story to hang on. They didn't know Dunbar. They knew the skeleton of Dunbar, but they didn't know him. They didn't know the world he lived in. They didn't know his friends, and they didn't know anything about him except he was born in 1872 in Dayton, Ohio. He graduated from Central High School at the age of eight. Dull as toast. So I learned the first lesson that every writer 
must learn. You will either learn it the hard way or just start from the beginning. Don't be afraid. Tear it up. Start over again. Or go in and say, I've got to move this. I've got to change this. The word, the formal word, is revision. And you will revise and revise until you figure, I can't revise anymore. And then you send it to the editor, and the first thing she says, oh, we've got lots of revision with this. <laughs> so revising is 90% of writing. I wrote that first book, my very first one, in 1971. It did not get published until 1982. I published other things before I published that book. No, I don't have to work on books that long anymore. But that first one took the discipline for me to learn how to rewrite, restructure, move things. Okay? Paul Lawrence Dunbar, that very first book. I've written many more biographies, but I learned that most important story most important thing, you must tell a good story. Character, action, setting, and idea. You have it in fiction as well as nonfiction. Somewhere along the line, we were taught that nonfiction is simply facts. That's not true. It's facts wrapped around a story, or facts put in a story. Let's go back to that porch again. This time, my grandmother is speaking in that soft tone of hers. She would tell hair-raising ghost stories. She would start at the hour of the dark 30. That's 30 minutes before it gets all the way dark and the monsters come out. <laughs> and I can hear her say, there used to be a woman who appeared under that street light over there. And our heads would all go as one to the street light. And it was as though we were looking for the lady who walked in front of our house and she didn't have a head. And when she got to this street light, she vanished. And then in the same breath, she would say, Pat, would you go in the house and get me a drink of water? <laughs> and I'd have to go into that creaky old house all by myself. It wasn't so bad in the living room because the light from the front porch filtered in. But when I got to the dining room, she had a table that had claw feet, you know, the kind I'm talking about. And I knew that that was a monster who lived underneath. And when I went by, it was going to snatch me by my ankles, pull me under the table, I'd never be heard from again. So I scaled along the wall carefully, making sure I didn't get too close to that table. When I got to the kitchen, it was pitch black dark back there. You could not see your hand before you. You said, well, why didn't you just switch on the light? Well, we didn't have a wall switch in that old country house. There was a light in the center of the room with a cord that hung down. And you had to go all the way into that dark, dark kitchen. It was like going into a mouth. And you go in, and you're feeling around for the pull switch. Meanwhile, my brother would slip around the side of the house. <laughs> he was really my, my, my uncle, but we grew up like siblings. It's my uncle brother, as I call him. But Leon would come in on the side. <clears throat> of the porch and come in the back door and stand by the refrigerator. And when I would switch on the light, he would jump out snarling like he was changing into Wolfman. <laughs> and I would look right in his face. I would know it was him. But he would, <laughs> and I, would start, I would start running. And I'd hop past the table and out through the living room. And my grandmother would hear us coming and say, don't slam, bam, the screen door. I loved being deliciously frightened by my grandmother's stories and at Scary Old House. The fear would start in my ankles and move up the back of my legs and up my spine like a closing zipper. I loved being frightened. 
as most young people love to be frightened. Fast forward again. I decided, you know, I'm going to tell my grandmother's stories. And so I wrote the Dark Thirty, Southern Tales of the Supernatural. It was a departure from the stories that I had been used to telling because I did picture books and nonfiction. I'd never written anything longer. And these are short stories, a collection of 10. And they're based on Southern stories that are scary. They're all original. They are my stories, but they're based on stories that I heard. They were like stories I heard. And one in particular comes from my growing up. We had monster rules when I was growing up. That's the way we managed our monsters. See, I was the founder and first president of Monster Watchers of America. I had eaten six boxes of crinkly cereal and saved the box top, sent off with 56, 50 cents. And some weeks later in the mail, I received six glow-in-the-dark ID badges. <laughs> oh, yes. And I invited five friends to join me. But the most prized possession was the monster rules, a book of 10 rules that helped us to manage the monsters. You know the monster rules, you know them. Let's give you a few. Monster rule number 10 says, monsters cannot come within the circle of light. If you have light, they can't come in that circle of light. Don't you love it? <laughs> monster rule number seven, you know this one. You don't play near where monsters live. <laughs> Isn't that common sense? You know, when they make the movies, why do they have people stay in houses and it's saying, get out? I wonder, I said, who wrote that? <laughs> so in my book, when the house says, get out, the people get out. <laughs> monster rule number five says you should never lie about seeing a monster. If you haven't seen it, you can't say that you have. But we all know that they're there. Those of us who are believers, we know they are there because you can see them just out of your sight. You hear them scratching around in the dark. Oh, they're there, all right. But you can't say you've seen one if you haven't. Monster rule number two, never let a monster see you cry. No matter how frightened you are, fluff up. <laughs> fluff up because when they see that you're frightened, that's when they make all those noises and scare you to death. So no matter how frightened you are, Never let them see you crying. And the last one, the prime directive. Master rule number one. If you love and you know you are loved, you are safe. Love protects against all monsters. Now, I did those monster rules in the Dark Thirty, the last story. And there is um, the chicken coop monster because I was certain that there was a monster that lived in my grandmother's chicken coop. And uh, it, was just, it was just a matter of time before it was going to get me. But I vanquished it by using the monster rules. And the last thing is I tell the monster, I'm not afraid of you anymore because I am the granddaughter. No, I am the oldest granddaughter of James Leon Oldham. He loves me, and I know it. And the monster vanished. And you know, even to this day, the monsters still do come. No, they're not the childhood monsters, but they're just as wicked. You might know them. The IRS. <laughs> I hope no IRS worker is here today. <laughs> But bad reviews, I think you know those. And of course, the isms, racism, sexism, ageism, regionalism. I mean, we can just go on and on with the isms. But I look at it all in the face and say, I am the oldest granddaughter of James Leon Oldham. He loves me, and I know it. He was a monster fighter, and so am I. That comes from. Uh, the Dark Thirty, Southern Tales of the Supernatural. I also 
said, well, okay, I've done the scary stories. I'll do the funny stories. And so porch lies. A porch lie is not a mean or a vicious lie. It's a, it's, it's a story of exaggeration and humor. And the one that Loretta told you about, Cake Norris, that's my grandfather. They called him Cake. All the people who knew him called him Cake because he used to steal the warm cake that his mother would put out to cool before she put the icing on. And he would cut a slice out of it and run and hide of a crawl space. <laughs> and so they started calling him Cake. So I use that in my story. So those two actually come from my grandmother. They, she was the germ, the seed of those two books and many others. Let's go back to that front porch again. This time, Daddy James is the storyteller. And we sit at his feet and listen to him tell stories about little girls named Sarah and Pat and a little boy named Nolan. That's my brother, my sister, and me. And we thought we were just as clever and just as smart and just as uh, brave as the children in his story. He always told stories that were vaguely familiar, but different somehow, because he told them his way. You see, I had no idea my grandfather was a functional illiterate. He loved books and encouraged me to read, encouraged all three of us, his grandchildren, to read. And the way he encouraged me, he would say, darling, read to me what they taught you up at the schoolhouse today. And I would whip out my Dick and Jane, and I would see Jane run. Run. He endured that. He allowed me to read to him. I had no idea that in other families, the adults read to the children. In my house, the children read to the adults. Imagine the confidence that they gave me in my reading. I always loved to read out loud to people. Enjoyed it immensely. So I would, he, he suffered through Dick and Jane all the way up through Julius Caesar. <laughs> and when I came to a word that was difficult, too difficult for me, I would sound and he would say, work with it, little sister, it'll come to you. He wouldn't jump in and tell me. He let me work it out, and so I did. I learned to sound out words. There was no adult jumping in and telling me the word. So naturally, that built my confidence. My grandmother and grandfather were from the old school. They didn't believe in checks. I can remember borrowing $25 from my grandmother and I came back and I was taking out my checkbook to pay her. And she said, no, darling, don't give me a little piece of paper. What did, what did you borrow? I said, $25. And how did I give it to you? I said, a 20 and a five. She said, well, then bring me that. She did not want a piece of paper, as she called it, a check. And they believed in paying their bills in cash at the place where they owed. So they went to the light company and paid their light bill. They went to the department store and paid whatever. They, they went there once or twice a week to, to take care of business. And in the process of going there, my grandmother would take me to the library. All along the way, there were places where we couldn't go in and we couldn't go to to Peace Fountain, we couldn't go to the Andrew Jackson Hotel, we couldn't go to Morrison's Cafeteria, we couldn't go to the Grand Ole Opera. If we did, we had to sit up in what they called the Buzzard's Roost. There was the Paramount Theater, we had to go in through the back door. You had to drink out of separate water fountains. It was a very negative and very negative experience. But when I got to the library, Right above the door, all are welcome, it said. And I could go in the front door, and I can remember the librarian. She had a little bun on the back of her head, 
sensible shoes, very stereotypical. <laughs> I look at librarians today and I go, and that's how librarians look. <laughs> They're gorgeous now, but librarians in my day were very, and she always spoke in a whisper. You didn't talk out loud in the library. You whispered. But she was so kind to me that I, I love librarians. And when they ask me to do something, it's hard for me to say no. And that's why I flew in the dark at night from Atlanta to come out here. <laughs> but it's because of that generosity of the Nashville Public Library. So I went there to get my books. And I would bring them home and I would read all three. And then the next week we would take them back to the library. So I read often, and if you read often, you read better. And when you read better, you read success. So I credit the National Public Library with my success as a, a young reader and a young writer. My grandfather had two books on his shelf. One was the King James Version of the Bible. The other was Bullfinch's Mythology. I have no idea of where he got that book, but it was that thick and it was on the mantle. I can see it as clearly as if I'm looking at them now. And as a kid, I can remember looking through, first looking at the pictures and then beginning to pick through some of the stories. And I learned to love those stories. And if you read my books as a collection, as some people have, you will see that those two books inform most of my writing in subtle ways, not overt, but in subtle ways, you can see those books and, and the influence that they have over my, on my writing. Daddy James would tell stories about little girls named Sarah and Pat and little boy named Nolan. And one he told in particular was one of my favorites. The three kids had a chore to do for grandmother, and that was to take a basket of eggs over to a neighbor's house. And along the way, they were confronted by a wolf, a bear, a snake, and a fox. But they tricked that fox, uh, the snake, and the fox, and the wolf, and the bear. They tricked them and got through the woods. Fast forward again, it's a long, long summer and I don't have a contract. And I said, well, you know, maybe I'll try to write something, write a picture book. I've never written a picture book before. So I sat at the word processor and I said, I'll write my grandfather's story. That's what I do. That'll be a cute little picture book. And so I did all 16 pages of it. <laughs> For those of you who know about a picture book, it's usually about six to seven pages long. And I sent it to my editor, Ann Schwartz, who was at that time at Dow Publishing House. She's since become, she has her own imprint, Ann Schwartz Books, and she's at Random House. But at the time, she was at Dial. And she was right out of college and she was a reader. And she read my manuscript. And she wrote me back a letter, lovely letter. And it said, I like your manuscript. It has possibilities. There is a story in there somewhere. <laughs> but it's way too much going on. You've got three kids, a grandmother, a grandfather. You got a bear, a snake, a wolf, and a fox. You got a dog and a cat and a neighbor. She said, it's way too much going on. If you'd like to rewrite it and shorten it somewhat, and I'd be glad to look at it again. But that's not my grandfather's story. Well, oh, I can't do that. And then I thought, I don't have a contract. So I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll get rid of my brother and sister. <laughs> and I'll keep myself. 
And I'll get rid of the wolf, the bear, and the snake. And I'll keep the fox because I like his voice. I dare say a little girl like you should be simply terrified of me. Whatever do they teach children in school these days? Well, whatever you are, you sure think a heap of yourself, said Flossie, as she skipped away from that fox, leaving him to try to prove that he really was who he said he was. Before long, she came to a tree. There, there were some flowers, and she picked some wildflowers for Miss Viola Fox, slid up beside her. Prepare to be frightened. I have the proof right here. I am a fox because I have thick, luxurious fur. Here, feel for yourself. And he leaned over for Flossie to stroke his back. Mm. It is soft. It feels, it feels just like rabbit's fur. You not a fox, you a rabbit all the time trying to fool me. A rabbit. Did you hear her call me a rabbit? A mere bunny. I have you know, young lady, that I am a fox of rare breed. I have raided some of the finest hen houses from Franklin to Madison. Rabbit indeed, I am a fox and you will act accordingly. Flossie hopped to her feet. She put her hands on her hips and she said, unless you can show your fox, I'll not accord you nothing. And she skipped away, leaving fox dumbfounded. She got all the way through the woods tricking that fox. He had been reduced to just sniveling and crying. and Oh, he was just a pitiful mess. Give me one last chance. I'm certain I can prove it. About that time, Flossie came out of the woods. She could see Miss Viola's cabin just a little ways in the distance. Fox didn't notice a thing. He was just begging to be believed. Wait, wait, here it is, here it is. I'm a fox, he said, yes, yes, perking up some, because I have sharp teeth and can run exceedingly fast. Flossie was bouncing back on her toes, up on her toes, back on her heels, up on her toes, back on her heels. She said, doesn't matter what I think anymore. What do you mean it doesn't matter anymore? Well, said Flossie, you've got sharp teeth and can run fast, and so does a hound dog. And one of Mr. J.W. McCutcheon's hound dogs is right behind you. And by the way he's looking, it's all over for you. But Fox dashed toward the woods. He called over his shoulder, not the worry. The hound dog knows who I am. Because I've been out running that old miserable mutt for years. Like I told you, I am the fox. And Flossie said, oh, I know. I know, as she turned toward Miss Viola's with the basket of eggs safely tucked under her arm. When I rewrote it and sent it back to Anne, it was seven pages long. And that was the beginning of our relationship. We have done many picture books together. Precious and the Boo Hag is one of the more recent ones. But I did Miranda and Brother Wynn, which was Jerry Pinckney's, one of Jerry Pinckney's first Caldecott honor books. I have done my dear's aprons. The latest one is Stitching and Pulling, and it's about the women of G's Bend. And I want you to just know that it's out there. These are about the women who made those wonderful quilts that are now hanging in museums all over the world. And G's Bend, Alabama was considered the poorest county in the country during the Depression. And the women made these quilts because they, were, they, were, they just needed them to keep their children warm and they would stack them to make a mattress. They covered the tables with them. They used them for their children to crawl on when they would go outside and have picnics. 
They use the quilts for everything, small ones and large ones. Now, today, those quilts are going for 25000 and more. So it was my pleasure to go to G's Bend and work with these ladies. And I had the opportunity to quilt with them. My next picture book, I will share this with you, and it's called Never Forgotten. And I'd like to share it because this is something that has been in process for about 20 years. I have been asking every African, West African that I met did you miss us? And what I mean by that was, are there stories in your culture that talk about the ones who were taken away? Did you tell stories? Did you sing songs, poetry, any, any remnant of anything that I could use to tell a story that comes from that side over to here? where you looked and longed for us the way we looked and longed for home. In all those years, I did not find one story. I did not find one song. I'm sure they're there, but I was unable to find them. And so I said, okay, instead of whining and wondering, I'll do it myself. So, it's written in free verse, and it is about uh, it's, it's about uh, a blacksmith, a West African blacksmith. And in West Africa, the Mende blacksmiths were thought, of to be, thought to be magicians. Seventeen twenty-five. Old Mali in the Shihio, West Africa. Beware. The drums speak a single message of warning. Beware. Beware of pale men riding in large seabirds with great white wings. Beware. Beware of men with the blue of the sky in their eyes who steal up the river through the great forest and into the savannah lands in search of slaves. Us. Beware. Hear the moans and groans of their captives, hundreds, thousands, stolen. We rarely speak of the taken, but I will this time because you have asked. Come back, back, back at the far edge of memory. We recall a Mende blacksmith, Dinka. By all accounts, a master craftsman, an artisan, worthy of praise, honored as a powerful magician, one who could speak the old names of the mother elements, earth, fire, water, wind, and they would do his bidding, Dinka. People sang praise songs to him. Though Dinka was a gifted blacksmith, first among the first, he is not remembered for that. He is best remembered for being a loving father. When Dinka's beloved wife of only a year died giving birth, Dinka put away his sorrow and embraced his newborn son. I will raise you myself, he declared. The elder women of his village argued against it, saying, he will grow up wild without the gentle hand of a mother, a gentle hand to guide him. You must abide by custom, take another wife, or give the baby to a woman who is childless. But Dinka could not be persuaded. How will you feed the baby? The women argued. You have no milk to give. Still Dinka would not change his mind. The tortoise does not have milk to give, but he, it knows how to take care of its young. Then shamelessly, he tied the baby on his back like a woman and headed for his forge at the place where seven generations of his clan had once stood. Dinka set his feet firmly on the ground and called to earth. Nagoma, 
thank you for yielding up the ore from your underground storehouse of treasures. Dinka lit the fire in its forge and called to fire. Nagumbi, thank you for making the ore pliable so that I might shape it. Dinka filled the calabash from the river and called to water. Zinloa, thank you for setting the iron and making it strong. Dinka fanned the bellows and fire rose up again. He called to win. Fifi, thank you for reviving fire and keeping my brow cool in the heat of the day. Then lifting his arms in praise, Dinka cried, come now elders, behold my beloved son. Mother Earth appeared first, ageless and forever beautiful. She kissed the baby, then spoke softly. See how he grabs my finger. Already he is strong like a mountain, my mountain son. Fire woman leaped into the air and swirled majestically in her flaming garment of red. He does not fear my blades. Clearly a sign he will be an inspired leader inspiring, forceful, and courageous. And she blew the child a warm kiss that made him cool. Water Maiden sang to the boy child an old lullaby. A baby has come, he has come, and happiness has come. A boy has come, he has come, and laughter has come. A son has come, he has come, and beauty has come. Then the child gurgled in reply. She tickled his toes and said, even now I can hear the music in his voice. Suddenly, wind spirit swished in, turning and spinning, flipping and swooping, and made the baby squeal happily. Wind gently embraced him and whispered in his ear, we will dance through the tall grasses, you and I, forever free. He is taken. He is taken uh, on board the ships, and the elements go out and look for him. And they do find him in South, Wynn finds him in South Carolina, in Charleston. Earth went looking for him, and then after Earth, fire went, but she could not get past the water. Water went and followed the ship. It came to the shores, and then Wynn was able to go across and follow and find him. But it was after many years that Wynne was able to find him. And I'll read that last part. Ibu, Seninke, Benin, Yorba, Wolof, Akan, Mandinka, all taken. All living in the Americas, I saw the taken shackle to the land from sunup to sundown, working tobacco, sugarcane, cotton, and rice. I visited the grand houses that their hands helped build. I listened to them sing and tell stories different, but strangely familiar. Characters I knew by other names, Anansi, now Ain't Nancy. Zomo the rabbit, now Br'er Rabbit. I stopped by kitchens and watched our women cook yams and okra, rice and beans. Then I realized they had not forgotten. Our children had not forgotten. And I rejoiced. Led by the sound of a blacksmith's hammer, I traveled to Charleston, South Carolina, to a simple shop with a shingle, John Shannon, blacksmith. A large European with red hair and beard stood at the forge, comfortable among his tools, tongs, fullers, swages, hardies. They were apprentices, two all African, working on pieces both new and old, familiar yet fresh. Then blacksmith Shannon said, Moses, I have sold another of your beautiful gates with the rice design. How did you learn to craft so well? A young man stepped into the light. I learned by reaching back with one hand and stretching forward with the other, he said. People say you are a genius, said Black Miss Smith Shannon. 
My father, Dinka, was the genius, replied the apprentice. He taught me what seven generations had learned. I am the eighth. I had found Musafa, our Musafa, who answers now to Moses Shannon. Musafa, Moses, both mean save through the water. He seems more confident at the forge now, wiser. Yet I also saw in his eyes the playful Musafa we all remember. I had so much to tell him, but he could not see me. He could not see me or hear me in this strange land. Still I kissed his brow. He touched the spot and smiled as if remembering. Our son has truly found the music in his hammer. His fences, railings, and banisters are handsomely decorated with birds, flowers, and animals inspired by his memories of home. I heard someone tell Moses, Blacksmith Shannon is going to free you one day soon. And to my joy, I heard Mustafa whisper, in my mind, I have always been free, as free as the wind. Thank you so much. Thank you.